IP rights and AI bots, uh, new partners or old adversaries? And we have an interesting group for this. One is remote, and I asked the panel to come up. All right, I guess we're ready to go. Can everyone hear me? Um, yeah. This is um, going to be, I think, a fun panel. We'll be kind of talking about where IP rights uh, and AI intersect, kind of where the rubber hits the road. Uh, and whether you're talking about copyright, patent, trademark, trade secrets, there's not really just one way that th these rights intersect with AI. There's multiple ways that they do, right? So you could be talking about the training materials that go into training AI models. Those materials may be protected by IP rights, like copyright or trade secret. Then we could also talk about authorship and inventorship. You know, if AI invents a new product, can it get a patent? Uh, if it uh, creates a new picture, a new image, can it get a copyright? Uh, and then what happens with the output of generative AI? Uh, can that infringe on existing rights? How does that impact uh, inventors, creators, companies that are involved in these businesses? And so there's a lot of, I think, very interesting, dynamic, exciting issues. Uh, and we got a great panel to, dis to, to, uh, to talk about them. Uh, I'm going to quickly let the panel introduce themselves. I'll start. My name's Terry Hart. I'm the general counsel of the Association of American Publishers. To my right. Uh, I'm Ryan Welsh. I'm the CEO and founder of Valkyrie. We do drone delivery operations. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Ryan Phelan, partner at Marshall Gerstein and Warren, which is a law firm um, in Chicago. Also a uh, professor at Northwestern University teaching topics of patenting software inventions. Glad to be back and sorry I didn't wear my purple tie today. <laughs> uh, and let's go to uh, Brian who's joining us virtually. Yeah, sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, very nice to almost see everyone, but I'm on the board of CIPU along with Bruce and um, I'm currently with Aon and um, I look forward to talking. I got a long uh, experience in intellectual property and dealing with this topic specifically. So yeah, it'd be great to chat. Fantastic. All right. So I thought we'd start at the beginning with uh, inventorship and authorship. And I'll go to Ryan Phelan. Um, in terms of whether AI can be an inventor, the USPTO has put out guidance on that. Can you talk a little bit about what have they said about AI inventorship and, and kind of how does that impact uh, your patent practice. Sure, will do. I'll have to be careful since I know that Jerry Ma is here, but um, <laughs> I, I have read the guidance. And um, it's interesting because right now uh, the, the key underlying issue for inventorship and authorship is the, the laws that were written uh, previously before AI uh, could generate things, generative AI like ChatGPT. So these laws include words um, in the actual statutory text that says things such as you know a person, a natural person, and an, an inventor is um, human, or at least suggests that. And so um, there has been case law uh, from cases that were brought in district court and made them themselves uh, all the way up to appellate courts, where uh, federal circuit, which is an appellate court for patents, uh, has said that a uh, an AI cannot be an inventor uh, in in the eyes of the law. So um, late last year, uh, President Biden put out an executive order asking uh, the Patent Office and other agencies to uh, d basically define um, how AI could be used in the inventorship process. And um, what the, the Patent Office did and its guidance that came out um, about a month or so ago, so it kind of leaned into um, some existing case law um, called the Penu Factors. And they, they, the, the high level uh, instruction was that AI um, inventions that were, that used AI as a tool to come up with an invention are not categorically unpatentable, meaning that it can be done, but you have to follow these Penu factors from the Federal Circuit, which is a case uh, from the late 1990s. And uh, the Penu factors, if you were gonna sum it up, is um, you have to have a significant contribution from the human, um, uh, into the patent claims, and if you can prove that, if you can verify that, then um, you can list that person as at least uh, an inventor, and uh, you could have a, um, a patent, even if the human used the AI tool like ChatGPT, for example, 
uh, to come up with an invention. And there's more nuances on that, but I'll, I'll pause there. Excellent, excellent. So um, turning to the copyright side, I think uh, in just like the patent trademark office is dealing with this question when it comes to the patent applications, the US Copyright Office is also dealing with the question of authorship when it comes to copyright registrations. Uh, and they also put out some guidance last year uh, that answered some questions, uh, I think raised some more questions. I just wanted to touch on that real quickly since that's the world I live in with, with publishers. We're dealing with copyright uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so the Copyright Office put out this policy guidance and uh, one thing it said was that AI uh, cannot be an author uh, for this very similar reasons. You know, if you look at the constitutional language, uh, providing Congress with the authority to uh, make copyright laws, if you look at the Copyright Act and the case law, the Copyright Office concluded no, uh, uh, human authorship is required to have copyright protection. Um, but then that raises the, the obvious next question. Well, what if it's a bit of a mix? What if uh, a human is using AI as a tool as part of their creative process? How does that affect copyright ability and their ability to uh, register their copyright? And here is where I think things got a little more tricky. Uh, one um, easy question that the Copyright Office answered was that uh, if you do have any AI generated content that's part of a work that you're registering, a copyright owner has to disclaim that as in, in their copyright application. Um, just similarly to how they today have to disclaim if there's any public domain material that is used in it or pre-existing material that is not part of their claim for authorship. But beyond that, um, you know, the Copyright Office said it's really, it's a fact-specific inquiry, right? They're looking at did the AI generate something that could be considered just mechanical reproduction, uh, in which case there's not sufficient human authorship there? Uh, or is it something that um, is part of, uh, and the language they use is the reflecting the author's own mental conception? Uh, these are, I think, really general, broad ideas. Um, the Copyright Office provided one example to put a little meat on the bones. They said using, uh, and looking at just current AI technology that I'm sure we've all kind of, you know, if we haven't used it in our professional lives, have at least played around with it, so we're, we're a little familiar with it. Um, the Copyright Office said, you know, if you're, if the human author's contribution is just putting in a prompt, like make a photograph of a golden retriever on a sunny day, that's not enough. Uh, to rise to the level of human authorship that's required for copyrightability. So that was the one example they provided. I think kind of the easy example, well, yeah, if, if that's all you're doing is typing in a few words and you're getting a picture and you're saying, okay, I want to register that copyright, that's, that's, not, gonna, that's not gonna work. But beyond that, um, you know, we'll have to see. Uh, and, and I would uh, note that this is certainly not the last word from the Copyright Office. This is just their initial uh, efforts to get more guidance out there uh, as this question becomes more and more um, uh, of an issue. Uh, but they'll you know, continue to uh, revise their uh, own uh, operating manuals, their own examination practices. They'll continue to, I think, educate the public as you know, more and more, I think, uh, recurring fact patterns may come out. They're able to address, you know, with more specificity. And of course, they also have a review board where um, if a copyright registration application is rejected, there's the option for the applicant to appeal that decision to the, uh, within the copyright office. Uh, and they publish the, re the decisions in those, those appeals on the website. And more and more we're seeing appeals of works that involve AI-generated contributions, and so that also will provide, I think, a little more guidance as things go on. Um, I don't know, Ryan Walsh, if you had any uh, you know, thoughts on this as an, a, a human inventor yourself. Yeah, on the, the alternative side of it, there was a, a comment made a couple of, maybe two months ago by Andreessen Horowitz, where they found out I have to pay for the data 
especially the copyrighted data that was coming in, and they're like, that will completely devastate our, our business model. Um, and it's been a common thing that's come up in the panels multiple times today is there's existing laws. This doesn't reshift the whole paradigm. And so I think that, you know, taking understanding of how the law is existing um, and shifting it in, as you both have mentioned, versus kind of what we're seeing emerge out of Silicon Valley, which is just kind of do whatever you want. AI is the new frontier, and I don't think that's correct. Um, but I do see a ton of opportunity, uh, especially where it's the data creation part of this, because that really is the, you know, the big oil uh, reserve right now, right? The data that you can capture and being able to have that copyrightable um, information that you can then sell for these models. So I, I do think there's a lot of opportunity in some of this arbitrage that's going on in, in some of the policy. Right. Yeah, just to add to that a little bit, um, and, and I think the earlier panel today alluded to it, is that data is the new oil. And that's one of the things that's going to be uh, figured out in all of these lawsuits. A lot of them pending currently in the state of California. Um, there was the, the one that was shown um, earlier today uh, regarding Getty and the other one with respect to New York Times. And they're all, they're all kind of saying the same thing is that uh, their data was misappropriated, taken and used to train these models. And uh, these uh, various artists and creators are owed some type of compensation for that, uh, whether it's uh, under the theory of copyright law or, um, or some other theory, uh, that, that threshold question needs to be answered. Um, you know, I'm a computer scientist myself. Uh, I know that, um, and a former developer and consultant at Accenture, so I know a lot of, uh, from the software perspective, um, a lot of uh, software developers, uh, at least back in the day, would go to a website called Stack Overflow. They would look at a bunch of code, maybe incorporate some of that into their own code base. and. Um, you know, if you have this model, like Copilot from Microsoft, now trained on a bunch of Stack Overflow uh, information, which I understand it is, then, you know, maybe Stack Overflow is also upset in, in addition to um, authors as well, so. Yeah, so I, it just, if I could add to that, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, if I'm a content creator, whether or not I'm an individual or, or a brand that's creating content, you know, it becomes a very difficult proposition because you're trying to police, right? You're trying to figure out what's going on out there in the world that might affect you. And so to, to a large extent, you know, these content creators have to find a way to proactively look for work that's in either a compiled data set or large scale data lakes or visual elements like logos or artwork and textual elements like image tags. And I mean, there are search tools that can do that, but other things that they can do is like monitoring social media, digital media channels for the appearance of works that might look like what they've got. You know, and for trademarks, you know, it goes beyond just looking for the trademark itself. They're looking for trade dress, perhaps, on, on, on the appearance of what it looks like. So there's a, a lot of, of, of churn in, that the content creators have. You know, I'm encouraged by some of the stuff that's going on in, in Washington. Well, specifically with some of the states like Tennessee. I don't know if it was discussed because I'm not there, but you know, they adopted this landmark law to protect artists against AI that is going to go into effect on July 1. I think that's encouraging because it allows, um, you know, it's really a first of a kind legislation to tackle this whole misuse of AI, by modifying the state law, which basically bans unauthorized copies of artists' work to cover musicians, their voices, and even their songs. So I'm encouraged by things like that. All right, thanks, Brian. Yeah, I, I, I would add, you know, on, just on the training data side, I mean, that's something certainly um, I hear from publishers um, as one of the, the big concerns. I mean, certainly there's opportunities and, and publishers are, are um, looking at AI opportunities, but in terms of, of the risks and the concerns, you know, they're seeing, um, you know, rather large companies scooping up all this data that includes copyrighted data that includes their own books or journal articles or whatnot. Um, and, you know, I heard someone once say on, online, you know, there's really three key things that um, create value for these AI companies, right? There's the, the algorithms, the AI technology models themselves. There's the computing power, you know, there's a lot of computing power that's needed. And then third is there's data. Right? You can't have um, quality output without quality input. 
And so given that data plays such a critical role in creating the value in AI, I think it's a very fair question for the, the original content creators, the original um, uh, authors and publishers who created that data in the first place to say, why aren't we a part of this value chain? Why are we uh, essentially like, you know, Andreeth and Horowitz who has said publicly and, and others, um, you know, big investors and big uh, advocates, um, you know, have said, you know, this is either, it's fair use, there's, you know, there's no reason we should pay or if we did have to get permission, that would essentially destroy the AI industry or make it, you know, non-competitive in other countries like may surpass the U.S. But, but it's, um, you know, a very valid point on the other side. Well, why should we as content creators be subsidizing, you know, that enormous value that you're able to capture on your own? Um, so I wanted to turn then because, you know, I think it's sort of a twin concern. There's, there's a concern just in... Um, the, the, the works that are protected by some intellectual property works that are going in as inputs to the AI models, but then there's the outputs that are coming out, which as Brian mentioned may touch upon, you know, uh, publicity rights or likeness rights. They could certainly touch, uh, you know, implicate trademark, copyright, maybe even, even patent. So I thought, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about the output. Brian, maybe, um, uh, if you could expand upon that, you know, how does um, copyright and patent trademark infringement apply to uh, AI creations, AI output? Yeah, so um, in, in, in the cases, at least that I've seen, you know, when, when it comes down to um, claims or enforcement of, this, of, of these matters relating to AI, you know, the whole legal system is being asked to um, to really clarify the bounds of what is a derivative work, right? So they have to sort of determine that under IP laws. And depending on the jurisdiction, um, different federal circuit courts may respond with different interpretations, which makes it much more complicated. So the outcome, you know, is expected to hinge on the interpretation of fair use doctrine. So really, how do you define that, which allows copyrighted work to be used, you know, without the owner's permission, um, so it's really looking at that and, and trying to figure out if uh, the copyrighted materials used in a manner that it was not intended to do. And, and that's what the courts are really being asked to do. And by the way, this isn't the first time that's happened, right? So you've had, if you look way back at Google, Google first, they successfully actually defended in, in a, a really precedential case itself against a lawsuit because they argued that um, transformative use allowed for the scraping of text from books and, and and other matters to create a search engine. And at least for the time being, that, that becomes a very precedential case. So of course, look at that as well. But it, it's a very hazy, at least from my perspective, very hazy environment. Yeah, just, just to add to that, uh, and, and thank you, Brian, uh, totally agree. Um, and I, I also think that derivative, derivative works, not only from like books and on artwork will will play a role or an impact, but also for software, which goes back to Ryan, your comment. Yeah. And um, one good example is one of the lawsuits that are pending is um, by G.R. Martin, which I, I, I mentioned him because he's a little Northwestern alum, but his book is uh, inside of a, data book, a database called Book 3, um, his uh, Game of Thrones books. And um, you can imagine if uh, an AI model was trained on Book 3, including you know, the, the Game of Thrones books, and um, if someone wanted to create a, uh, a story or, or a derivative story, a derivative work on Tyrion Lannister, they could ask the model to create like some kind of narrative new story about you know, Game of Thrones, Tyrion Lannister doing uh, any number of things. And it would generate that only if the model had been trained previously on uh, Mr. Martin's works. So if you have uh, a new output coming from uh, the model that was once trained on his works, you know, it's probably you know, a court would consider that to be a derivative work. So that would be one way um, that you could, you know, Mr. Martin could argue that um, his, his work had been taken, or at least the output uh, of that work is um, in, infringed. That was because that model uh, at some point had been stored in computer memory and was copied, uh, which would also be uh, a, a way that he could argue copyright infringement too. 
if you apply that to software, you could say that um, if you're a software uh, author that provided your uh, computer software to like say Stack Overflow or GitHub or something like that, uh, perhaps your, your information was copied in computer memory at some time, at some point for training. And oh, by the way, perhaps it could also be detected as a derivative work inside of that software later uh, by a competitor and found to be infringing as well. So there's a lot of things that could come out of the copyright side of the output. Yeah, and I think the, the derivative works piece is actually something that's been keeping me up a lot. For instance, Meta, right? They, they have everything about everybody since you signed up for Facebook in middle school or whatever, right? Um, and now we have certain you know, precedents in place as far as publicly recreating you, but who's to say what that distinctive feature is of your data in the sense of if I'm meta and I go make a digital twin in you know, a metaverse, right? That I'm running models on, doing simulations, acting out predictive text and, and predictive behaviors, mm -hmm. and I'm doing this based on all of your information. Do you actually own your own likeness in that regard? And I think that's kind of the, the derivative works and some of these outputs that are really uh, the, the scary piece of this that could, you know, be a control point we don't even know we're giving up. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, and that raises, like you said, very scary issues, probably less IP related, you know, from an IP perspective and just generally. I mean, certainly, um, you know, there's worries about just scammers mm -hmm. who are able to clone someone's voice and then, you know, go to relatives and, and you know, the uh, talk on the phone and it sounds like, you know, the, oh, this is my, my sister and she's asking for money or, or whatever, you know, and, and just issues like that. What but, makes it your voice? Yeah. Right? Is it the pitch, the inflection, the tone, the cadence? I mean, there's so many variables that you can't necessarily own. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So is that is that something that IP can can deal with? Is that something, you know, that you have to deal with in another way? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it just... Um, you know, that you know, certainly can keep everybody up at night. <laughs> um, but, but bringing it back a little bit more to the IP world, uh, you know, you do see some really interesting, um, I think, fact patterns coming out um, with the outputs that AI, uh, the, the popular AI models created and because of the training materials. So, you know, you see stories where uh, someone will input a prompt of, I want a picture of, of Wonder Woman and the, the output will be a picture of Gal Gadot, the actress who played Wonder Woman in the, mm. the, the most recent crop of DC movies. And so that, you know, obviously it was trained on maybe movie stills and it made that, that um, uh, assumption that, you know, this is what Wonder Woman looks like, but it raises issues of, you know, rights of likeness, rights of publicity for, for Gal Gadot and other, other performers. I mean, with Trademark, we had, you know, some images from the Getty Images uh, lawsuit earlier, and I don't know if it was, it was clear there, but one of the, the points that, that was made in that litigation is because um, the, the images that were used to train stability, uh, AI's model, were taken from the public-facing images that Getty puts out. Uh, and Getty Images puts their watermark, their famous Getty Images yeah. watermark on there. That's incorporated in the training process. And so a lot of the output will not only be images of, you know, soccer players or, or uh, public events, but they will also have, you know, sometimes really humorously malformed, but recognizably still that, um, that watermark of Getty Images, which is, of course, their brand, their trademark. And so that raises questions about, you know, to what extent training materials also have recognizable marks, recognizable things that a brand owner uh, may be concerned about because they're appearing in, in AI-generated generated output. Um, I think there's another famous example that, that's called the Italian plumber problem where you know, you, there are certain, um, certain prompts that uh, are so closely associated with really recognizable properties out there. So if you ask for an image of an Italian plumber, there's a lot of uh, examples of where uh, the result will be a picture of Mario from Super Mario Brothers. You know, one of probably the most famous Italian plumbers, um, although I don't think he's famous because of his plumbing abilities, but uh, nevertheless, you know, there's, there's, I think, a whole example of, of unknown impacts 
to IP owners that we're just starting to see and starting to get um, the ability to recognize and, and certainly, um, you know, at some point, uh, brand owners, content owners, creators, policy makers will have to see if, if the existing laws are, are, are adequate to address those or, or if they need to be um, uh, uh, updated. Um, we haven't really mentioned trade secrets, but um, that comes into play, um, I think, in an interesting way. Ryan, if you wanted to talk about, you know, when you're using yeah. AI as a, as a company or as an individual uh, and you're inputting not just prompts, but maybe data that might be uh, protected by trade secret, you know, what do you, what do you need to keep in mind with that? Well, it's a risk, right? So there's, there's always the risk of maybe accidentally sharing confidential trade secrets or, or business information, maybe know-how by inputting data, right, into these tools. Right, so you just have to be careful because the whole area of trade secrets obviously is something that's um, murky if you don't really know how, you know, if it's not defined crisply, if it's not, you know, if you haven't conducted reasonable measures to protect it, you know, there's, you know, the Defense Trade Secrets Act is very clear on, on what's a trade secret and what's not, but assuming that it is, um, it can be accidentally shared um, by putting the data into these tools. So it's it's, it's, it's very much a concern for um, for companies that use generative AI and um, and as far as as knowing if you know you mentioned training data itself if a business user is aware that training data might include unlicensed works or that AI can generate unauthorized derivative works not covered by fair use then they could be on the hook potentially for willful damages as well so there's a lot of um, Concern, but trade secrets, most specifically, it's um, yeah, you have to be careful. And I'll add to that too. Um, you know, the, the previous panel mentioned uh, divided infringement, and I think a lot of times, as uh, an attorney, uh, you think about you know trade secrets and patents as kind of two sides of the same coin. Where as if you know, if, if the AI or whatever technology, but since we're talking about AI, I'll limit it to AI. The AI tool is more on a server or more in the background where it'd be difficult to detect infringement from a patenting perspective. Um, you know, usually it's it's safer and wiser to keep it on the trade secret side because it would be hard it, as a patent writer or a patent practitioner, someone that's trying to get a patent for an AI uh, invention to find potential infringers and enforce that patent. However, if you have a aspect of your AI tool that has at least one foot outside of the, the back end side. Maybe you have a user interface, maybe you have, uh, you have marketing materials where you're um, telling the world that your, whatever tool that you're selling, whatever product that you're selling uses AI in a certain way, um, then, or, and you expect your competitors to do that, that would probably be a good um, reason to get an AI patent on. And I know that the, the previous panel also said that it's very hard to patent software uh, in the US. Um, you know, I, I disagree just because there's many, many, many patents um, for software out there, even despite the AIA Act and despite the Alice uh, court case that came out that had a, a huge impact on subject matter eligibility, which is really the, the big thing that changed uh, practicing software patents. Um, in fact, I've written several articles on, this, on statistics uh, with respect to AI patents uh, being granted in the U.S., and they are, they are quite high. Um, the USPTO has an example uh, out there about how to, in fact, uh, get an AI-related uh, patent. And there's many strategies on this uh, for a divided infringement strategy, and I'll, I won't go into it uh, too detailed, but you know, there's many aspects that you can claim in your patent, including what data are you using to train a particular model, assuming that you're using supervised training, for example. Maybe you have a special secret sauce of uh, data or a mix of data that you use that can go into the claim. Uh, to inform how your model is unique. And um, you can have that unique model having a unique output that can also give you novelty and non-obviousness for a patent. And you can set all of those things uh, for your AI. And, and you can have um, that AI model once trained deployed in a certain manner uh, for use. And you can set all of those things into different uh, claim sets, independent claims, independent claims for fallback positions, and uh, be successful in uh, patenting uh, your AI product or tool. And um, like I said, there's uh, many, many patents. There's been explosive growth in patents on AI. 
Um, it, it's quite popular not only in the U.S., but um, in other jurisdictions as well. Great. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, my, uh, my first patent got overturned by Alice, so I, I feel for that. Um, <laughs> I actually have taken a bit of a different strategy uh, post-AIA, uh, particularly around the hardware piece, um, because you know, there was a lot of uh, question, particularly right after Alice, until some of the clarifications came through. Um, and so just as a, a sheer allocation of funding, you know, as a startup, you only have so much, you can only go after so many things. And, and so we focused on the hardware where the actual data was being captured, for instance, our, our drone infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, obviously there's a few different ways to, to go about the strategy on that, but uh, all of them are fascinating to me. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you had anything, any thoughts on this? Uh, no, I, other than what I mentioned on the trade secrets, I think that uh, I, I agree uh, with, with what the speakers have said as well. Great. Well, uh, let's stay with you, Brian, because I did um, kind of want to get into more about ownership of outputs rather than infringement. So, you know, you have a, an AI model, but then you have a user, a company that's maybe using the AI model to generate outputs that they may be using in their business. Is it clear who owns that, that content when generative AI platforms create for you or your customers? Well, it's not clear, and um, and you have, you know, I wouldn't say an obligation, but you should have um, a a way to to determine this. So, if I'm, you know, for instance, if I'm a business, right? I'm a business that's sort of running, um, you know, looking at at using, um, for, you know, using some of these AI platforms. You know, they should be evaluating their transaction terms and these contracts that they have to write protections in the contract. So a way that they can do this is they demand uh, terms of service uh, from generative AI platforms that confirm the proper licensure to make sure that they've got the right licensing of the training data that feed the AI that goes into the stuff that they're using. And, you know, to the extent they can get it, I'm not sure that they would obtain it, but I certainly would want to ask for it. Uh, is uh, a broad indemnification for potential IP infringement caused by a failure of these companies not to do that policing or to properly license or support this. I think that's another way that, that businesses can, can sort of look at this. But as a minimum, they should add um, disclosures, uh, I think, to their uh, vendor and customer agreements for custom services and products. If either party was using a uh, generative AI to... Um, to ensure that the IP rights are understood and protected on both sides of the table. Uh, some, some firms are using, I know we uh, started doing this, uh, even um, you know, with an AON to try and, and look at using an AI checklist for contract modifications for their clients that uh, really assesses each clause for AI implications so that way you're reducing uh, the unintended use uh, or the unintended risks of use. So that's you know, if I'm a business, those are some of the things I'd be concerned about. Great. Um, yeah, and I would add, yeah. just from a, I think from a content creator perspective, especially an, an independent content creator, um, you know, it's just to be aware of the, the terms of service of the platform, to make sure yeah. that you understand, you know, kind of what are the implications for your own IP, right? If you're uh, a graphic artist, uh, and you're using a tool that lets you upload your own images to generate more images, you know, what happens to those images you upload? Um, are you losing rights from those? Are they being uh, used to further train the model um, for, for other people, not just yourself? You know, for some creators, that may be an important consideration that, you know, they may not, they may not want that or, or uh, they, uh, you know, may, may feel strongly against that, but... But just having that awareness, you know, in, in looking at the terms of service, because they are fun, they are really easy to use. But, you know, if, if you start um, uploading your own data, uploading your own works, um, you know, there may be IP in, implications there as well. Um, so I know we, we've, we focus a lot on risks. Uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about the bright side of AI. Um, 
I'll start with you, Ryan. From, from the perspective of, of an inventor, what, what opportunities do you see uh, with AI and, and particularly when it comes to IP? Yeah, so all of these questions that are kind of in this discussion today across all these panels are really where the opportunities are, right? I mean, there, there has to be some ground made in this, and it's going to be in these specific areas, whether it's on the digital twins or on the um, you know algorithms themselves. Um, I still think the actual data capture piece is by far the, the most interesting. I see that as the big oil wells, so to speak. I absolutely equate data to oil these days. It, it's the same thing. Um, and so there's a lot of different layers to this where there's opportunities from you know, building the algorithms, doing the data capture, brokering everything, arbitraging between all the different players. There, there's just so many and finding that niche and, and being able to protect it is critical. So not every piece of this is going to be patentable, but those that control the infrastructure of this are going to drastically control the power plays of the future. Thanks. Yeah, I agree. And I would add that uh, I would say speed and efficiency. That's what, you know, AI is. Um, that's why a lot of people are excited about it. Um, I'm happy to be the secretary of the Emerging Technology Committee of the American IP Legal Association, AIPLA. And uh, we had a conference um, last October and uh, one in-house counsel gets up and he's trying to uh, talk about, he, he's talking about AI and, you know, why his particular company is using it, and he says speed and efficiency. And he basically said, I cannot stop my software developers from using AI right now, um, a, you know, a tool like Copilot or something like this, because my developers tell me that they can write code 10x times, like 10, 10 times as fast as before. And as a developer, I know myself, you know, if you wanted to write code before, it was very procedural. You write it line by line, you know, it's, the code is going to execute you know, one line after another. Now you can kind of flip that on its head. Now you have this black box that you can train AI or you can use an open source LLM model or something like this. And um, you can plug that into your code. It can do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Or you can ask an IDE like uh, Copilot to write code for you. And that's where you get a lot of the speed increases. So you can ask it to write, um, you know, a routine that may take you, you know, a whole day or half a day to write, maybe this uh, code could spit it out in 30 seconds and you spend 30 minutes, um, you know, massaging it into to what you want. So um, his point was we would use it for speed and efficiency, but we have to be careful. There's legal risks uh, involved. Uh, previous pan panel mentioned some of these, including, you know, disclosure to models uh, used for retraining, stuff like this. But um, that's at least, you know, one of the bright sides of AI that people are excited about. Terry, can we go to questions uh, now or start taking audience questions? Sure, let's, uh, let's start taking audience questions. I want to give Brian a chance to weigh in on, on this last one and then we'll get to, to some audience Yeah, questions. so I think, um, I, I agree, developers, I think it's a great opportunity, right, for, for developers uh, included to as, as in AI, I think. But once again, they have to take, they have to take the initiative about the ways that they source their data. And I think it, and it's important for their investors as well. Uh, the investors, if I'm an investor into these companies, private equity or otherwise, they need to know the origins of the data as well. Great. Um, all right, I think. Sure. <clears throat> so I, a great business idea came to me if I were Google. So they have, of course, all the patents in their database. You, you patent search, you often come up with Google. And I would say, well, let me look at all the patents that have been filed, not issued, and put my requests in and look for ideas for uh, software to build, things to write, uh, new solutions to problems that I might not have thought of. And then since I don't really care about being sued because it's a cost that I can outspend them, then I'll go ahead and build these things and use the public availability of patents as a training tool for me to build my new ideas. Anybody want to invest in that idea? <laughs> um, All right. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I think, um, you know, there's analogous things like that happening with AI now, right? So um, my members include not just trade publishers, but also scientific and scholarly journal publishers who have, you know, decades and decades of research articles, journal articles 
Um, and they have for years now been using those to train for, you know, even before generative AI with text and data mining and other computational analysis. And part of that analysis is doing exactly that, is mining the existing literature and looking for new insights, you know, whether that's new, uh, you know, new medicines or new chemical composition. So that's certainly happening, I think, to some extent there. But yeah, I add to that. Have you heard of Dr. Stephen Thaler before? So he tried that, right? So he had an AI inventing machine called Dabas, and it was spitting out these inventions. In fact, it spit out allegedly two inventions, one um, directed towards a uh, beverage container that could snap together, another one being a neuron flare. He filed it with the USPTO, long story short, it went up to the federal circuit and got denied because there was no um, human inventor. So that's what happened. I imagine Google would fall into the same camp uh, if they tried. Uh, uh, a side note, um, and, you know, uh, there is a website called allprior.com that is generating these abstract ideas, uh, allegedly using an LLM or some kind of chat GPT tool and just publishing this stuff out there on the internet is yet to be seen. And Kathy Vidal, the USPTO director, uh, recently mentioned, um, and perhaps Jerry Ma, you know, you know more about this than me, but um, she recently mentioned, like, will this... Uh, LLM or GPT generated uh, text online, will that be considered actual prior art uh, in the future? We don't know. Like a court, as far as I know, has not opined on that. So that's uh, an interesting other use of, you know, having a machine just kind of randomly spew out uh, inventions and text um, uh, on the prior art side. So the, I think there's two really, really big risks coming with AI, and that's one of them, is it's going to increase the inequality um, because you will have these large tech companies that effectively have a default monopoly on some of this, and who's to say behind the scenes that a human isn't there adding to these ideas and then, and then filing them, right? So, um, you know, the other one being when they subtly affect our lives without us even knowing it, but that's the first step in, in getting there. And so um, I think that is single-handedly one of the biggest risks involved, period. Okay. All right, another question. Yes, yeah, this kind of stems on that. Um, in regards to both authorship and inventorship, um, the PTOs and the Copyright Office is pretty much an honor system until you get challenged in court, right? Is there a way for a system that's being created to determine whether or not a significant contribution for patents or whatever was written by an AI to confirm that or to test it? Um, otherwise, it's the only time I can imagine you would find out that um, his patent that was you know, created by an LLM was actually created by an LLM would be court, right? Yeah, um, it, that's, a, that's a good question. It's an interesting way that the two offices approached that question. The Copyright Office imposed um, from their guidance at least a duty to disclose whether or not you used AI in creation of your work. The, the, the USPTO's guidance um, did not impose a duty, uh, a strict duty to uh, disclose, but you still have your reporting duty um, and you still have to follow, according to the USPTO guidance, um, the significant contribution. So, it's interesting that they took slightly divergent approaches um, on the duty to report or not. Uh, for example, uh, one of the, the, the examples that uh, came out recently from the Copyright Office was this uh, piece of work called the Theater de Opera, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And it was um, an artist who created an artwork using, uh, I think, Midjourney or another tool like this. It was uh, an amazing piece of art. It won the Colorado State Fair in like not too long ago, 2022, I think it was. And the artist um, took the original work, the output of the AI, and enhanced it by adding some pieces to it. So he tried to register it. The Copyright Office found out that um, it was both a combination of the output of the AI plus his uh, work that he added to it to enhance the image. And Copyright Office basically said, you can, you can copyright your contributions as a human, but the, um, the portions that was output by the AI, you cannot own that because it was AI generated. And I believe the artist said, no thanks, I just don't want to copyright it all, he left. And that was despite that artist um, inputting or at least working with the model over 500 plus times according to the artist to get to that work. Um, he still didn't, you know, at least 
uh, get a copyright on his work. He, it seems like he could have, at least on the portion that he uh, provided, but he just, I, I assume just from reading the back and forth, he, he was so upset that he just didn't pursue that minimal work. Yeah, I would have just two things on that. I mean, it's, it, is a, it is a great question. Um, from the copyright side, you know, I think the US Copyright Office has said it, it's exploring the use of tools uh, that its examiners can use to potentially detect works that are generated by AI. Of course, um, anyone that's familiar with those tools knows there's a lot of false positives, a lot of false negatives. So whether or not that becomes a useful part of the tool, you know, will, will remain to be seen. Um, but second, I think, you know, that question of whether there was, you know, AI contributions to work and whether uh, a, an author truthfully disclosed that or disclosed the extent to that, you know, that's not really that much different from what they have to um, say about any other issue when they're making a copyright registration. You know, if, if someone um, is registering a work and actually it's you know under the law considered a joint work because someone helped them and they say no no I was a sole author, no that's the same same kind of scenario right the copyright office can only rely really on the facts that are disclosed to that and make their determinations there and um, it really is only if this goes in front of a court that a court has to actually uh, look and see if there is a dispute over what the copyright owner said. One more question. One more question. Oh, um, this question's for Ryan. Um, yes. So with derivative works, oftentimes the author of the original work that was used in that derivative work can retain control over that derivative work. Um, in the wake of AI being used as a tool to create uh, derivative works, um, what is your prediction in terms of what that control would look like? Would the control over that work be the output from that AI, or would the control over the derivative work be over the query or the prompt used to make that work? And I'm just going to confirm there's a, there's a Brian and two Ryans on the panel. So oh, you... Ryan. <laughs> uh. Okay, um, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, uh, Ryan Phelan. Yeah. So uh, I think it would fall into the confines of traditional derivative work copyright law to see how closely related the output of the work uh, would be irrespective of the input. Um, so you know, if you can see that the work was derived uh, from an existing work, then that would be a telltale sign. Uh, my example that I gave of you know the Tyrion, Tyrion Lannister with Game of Thrones is um, pretty good. I, I think that you know, if you have a model that was trained with a particular work and you ask it uh, to do something, like it either, it either is going to be trained on that or not. And so you would, you would know whether or not um, that model uh, was uh, significantly knowledgeable about you know, Tyrion Lannister or whatever the subject matter may be. So. Thank you. Bruce, is that, yeah. do we have time for any no, more? That's, that's it, unfortunately. <laughs>